Zai will talk about um, uh, the Mets box gene family in wheat. And uh, when you just had your lunch, you probably weren't aware of it, and usually we take it for granted, but we all rely, uh, rely on products and produce that are made from crops every day. So if you eat your fruits and vegetables, if you eat grains, nuts, seeds, or legumes, our fabric is made from cotton, and even if you prefer more, uh, more junky food or coke, um, that is all still made from crops. So the sugar in your coke is made from corn, and that's also what your cattle was fed on. So human civilization as we know it just wouldn't be possible without crops and their domestication. And all these plants that feed us every day, they started out as wild ancestor plants with little yield, with tiny fruits, with shattering seeds. So the question arises, how did we domesticate them? Or in the case of wheat, how did we go from like tiny grains um, uh, to, the, to the modern bread wheat that we have today? How did wheat that originated in the, somewhere in the Middle East uh, adapted to so many different climates? And how did it adapt to different biotic and abiotic stresses? And what we're really asking here is, what are the genetic basis of these domestication events? Because if we can understand the genetics of this domestication, we might be able to use the, this knowledge to improve our modern day crops. And one uh, major groups, group of genes that facilitate domestication uh, are transcription factors, because these are proteins that regulate the expression of many, many other genes, so you can think of them as the mastermind of the plant. And one large transcription factor family are uh, MADS domain transcription factor, uh, MADS domain transcription factors that, that are encoded by MADS box genes. And uh, MADS is just an acronym for the first four uh, founder proteins, so MCM1 from, from uh, yeast, agamas and deficients from plants, and SRS from humans. So you can see you find them in all eukaryotes, but they are especially um, uh, a large family in plants. And uh, MADS domain transcription factors play a really essential role in plant development. And um, uh, one major advantage of when, when you're working with them is that they are really well studied and that they are very well characterized phylogenetically and uh, functionally, uh, for example, in model plants, but also in crop plants. And we know that they are very well um, defined subfamilies with very specialized functions. Um, and there are actually many different uh, examples where, meds box where changes in meds box genes uh, led to desirable traits in crop plants during domestication. So what we did in this illustration is we mapped um, examples uh, of changes uh, to the life cycle of a generic plant. So for example, seedlessness in grapes, this is conferred by a seed stick like, like Metzbox genes. Or vernalization and flowering time control in grasses, that is very well studied and th those are also um, conferred by Metzbox genes. And for example, fruit abscission in tomato this is also conferred by changes in the Metzbox gene. So because we knew that Metzbox genes are so such important regulators of plant development, we wanted to take a look at them in wheat. And so it came in handy that we had early access to the IWGSC um, genome sequence uh, uh, that uh, Catherine was talking about. However, wheat is really not the easiest uh, species and uh, to work with genetically, and Catherine also touched on that. So other people would work with, with uh, diploid species. You, there you have maybe different alleles for one gene, and you have homolog uh, chromosomes. Um, but wheat, essentially, when you want to characterize wheat, you're essentially dealing with three different genomes, and that is because of the uh, of, um, polymerization events in the past. So, and it basically what you find for many, many genes is where you have one in Arabidopsis or in rice, you, have, will, you will have three genes in, uh, in wheat. And you will have an, you, because you have an A, 
and B in the D genome. And these three genes we would refer to as homeologs. Another nice thing about wheat is that it has a very large genome. So the Arabidopsis genome is pretty small with 120 megabases. Drosophila only slightly larger. Rice, 400 megabases, still pretty manageable. The human genome is 3,000 uh, megabases or 3 gigabases. Whoops, but wheat dwarfs them all with, with, with 16 gigabases. And on top of that, wheat also has a lot of um, transposable elements. Um, yeah, so not, not the easiest species to work with. Still, we wanted to take a look at Matzbox genes and wheat. And from Arabidopsis, we knew that, and from rice, that uh, there are about 45 genes that we wanted to look at. So if we consider a 3 to 1 ratio, we would expect about 140 genes. What we found was actually 201 genes. And um, we took all the genes that we knew from Arabidopsis and rice and put them together with our wheat genes and we constructed this um, phylogeny. And if we take a more detailed, or what the first thing that we see here is that um, uh, wheat mats box genes, uh, or wheat has all the, the different subclades that we would uh, expect for a monocot. So that was reassuring. Um, and it again, it, it underlines the significance of these genes. <coughs> and um, uh, if, you took, uh, if, you, if you look a little bit closer into the phylogeny, what we generally will find is three different wheat genes. So from the, one from the A, one from the B, and one from the D genome. A kind of closely related rice gene, and then a more distantly related Arabidopsis gene. So um, basically, the gene phylogeny will follow uh, the species phylogeny. And as I said, this is the case for, for many different subclades. Just to show you one example, the agamos and seed stick uh, family, we do have, um, for example, the first agamos gene um, from the A, from the B, and from the D genome. Then we have uh, the osmats is always from rice. And then we have more distantly related um, the Arabidopsis gene. And from Arabidopsis and also from rice, we know that this subclade of genes is known to uh, regulate uh, reproductive organ development and seed development. And if we look in the published um, RNA-seq data, we find, uh, we can see very nicely, okay, there's a very narrow expression just in the, in the ovule uh, or in the, in the carpal, in the, sta in the stamen, and, uh, and also in the grain. And we find that again and again for, for different subclades that these expression patterns are very well conserved in Arabidopsis, in rice, and then also in wheat. And we, what we find very, very often is this one to one to one ratio. So we have one gene in the A genome, one in the B, and one in the D genome. Uh, and when we look at an overall picture, uh, for, for, for all the Matzbox genes, we see that uh, almost one-third is in this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. And um, sometimes we get what we call in parallax. So there's a, a secondary duplication of one gene. So that's the N here is for all numbers higher than one. Uh, whereas if you look overall in all the wheat genes, it's only about 40% that there are in this uh, that are in this constellation. So again, this underlines the significance of these genes. And obviously, there is an evolutionary incentive to keep all the three homeologs. However, some, um, some of the clades are actually bigger than we expected. So for example, AGL17-like genes. We know that there are six of them in rice, so we would expect around 18 to 20, maybe. What we find is actually 47. And um, the same is true for FLC-like genes, Sepalata-like genes, and B-sister genes. Uh, but yeah, what does, w uh, what does that mean? We, we, we were a bit puzzled by this find finding. And um, can, we, can we maybe find an evolutionary explanation for that, or at least a, a mechanistic one? And we knew from the, from the IWGSC um, data that there is actually um, 
uh, if you look at if you look at the chromosome and at the, at the distal regions, that you find much more genes in the in the in the in the in the distal chromosomal regions as compared to the centromeric regions. And this is because you also you have much more recombination at the at the end of the chromosomes. So um, and also on top of that, you will find uh, uh, enrichment in defense genes at the uh, at the end of the chromosome, as opposed to you will find more housekeeping uh, genes in in the centromere. So when we looked at our um, at our Matzbox genes here, and we looked at each subclade individually, and we plotted the number of genes in the subclade um, against the percentage of genes that are in subtelomeric regions, we actually find a kind of a nice correlation. So we have down here one group, whereas we have, ag again, our agamos and uh, seed stick very high, um, uh, very, very highly conserved function, and those genes are almost, uh, there, there's none of those genes are in these distal telomeric regions. And on the other end of the spectrum, AGL17-like genes, like the biggest group, and also these sister genes, um, they, they, they are almost all in, in, in these uh, subtelomeric regions. So there seems to be a, a, a mechanistic uh, function. And... Um, uh, what, so, but what does, it, that, uh, was, what does that tell us? So it might be only like pseudogenes and um, indeed uh, for some of those genes we find that they have uh, quite a low expression or we cannot find any expression at all during the de developmental uh, cycle. Um, but for other genes we also find very specific expression. And um, uh, our explanation is that after these, uh, some of these genes duplicated, they're actually free to undergo uh, subfunctionalization or even uh, neofunctionalization. And in the case of FLC genes, for example, we know from Arabidopsis and uh, from rice and also from, preliminary or from, from, from data from wheat that these genes are involved in flowering time and vernalization control. So wheat that origi originated in the Middle East, but is now grown in all kinds of different climates, maybe for wheat it was of advantage to have um, these duplication events and an enlarged FLC clade to adapt to different climates by subfunctionalization or kind of a fine tuning of flowering time. And, uh, and uh, what we find for, for, for the AGA17-like genes and also surprisingly for, for the sister genes is that some of those genes were actually upregulated in response to different biotic and abiotic stresses. So AGA17-like genes, we found that they were upregulated in heat response and also in stripe rust response. And the sister genes, which are usually very narrowly expressed during uh, ovule and seed development, for those, we found that some of those genes were actually upregulated in response of uh, Fusarium head blight uh, infection. So, we of course, it, uh, so this is this can be, we, or we read that as evidence that um, there might be some some, some f new functionalization um, going on. So I, ho I hope I could convince you today of the following points. So Metzbox genes are really important key players for not only wheat, but general plant development. They have very high homeolog retention in wheat and a very conserved expression pattern. But also, on the other hand, they might um, have contributed to the success of wheat by neo and subfunctionalization. Uh, and they would actually make really good candidates for um, further crop improvement. And with that, um, I want to thank all the people involved in the project. I want to thank Carl and the uh, organizing committee that gave me the, uh, this, the opportunity to give this talk today. And I want to thank you for listening. I'm happy to take your questions.